Okay, question for you all. If you could just pick up your pen and I'm going to ask you to jot down a couple of things. So we're about to talk about suicide and as Emily had mentioned earlier, if this is a topic that for whatever reason um, you would like to leave the room and not be part of the discussion, please feel free. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody is as comfortable as possible. This is a very um, delicate topic and probably looking at the age of everyone in this room, I can probably say that most everyone has been touched in some way with suicide um, at this point. So when we think about suicide, I'd like you to write down an age that you think is the most prevalent for someone committing suicide. Just any age from zero to 110, what age do you think is the most prevalent? Then I'm going to ask you ethnicity, and I'm only going to give you a choice of four, so I'm going to make it easy for you. What ethnic group do you think commits suicide at the highest rate? Is it white slash Caucasian, black slash African American, American Indian, or Asian slash Pacific Islander? So again, you have white, black, American Indian, or Asian slash Pacific Islander. Of those four, which group do you think commits suicide at the highest rate? And write that down. And then without giving you a choice, I'd like you to please write down what means of suicide you think is the most prevalent the way in which it's carried out. Okay, wanna have their answers? So for the first question, I am going to give you age ranges and that age that you wrote down write down the age range next to it, okay? So the first question was, what age range has the highest suicide rate? So we're going from the age of less than 15, 15 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, 65 to 74, 75 to 84, 85 or older. So everyone has their age range? Okay, now I'm going to read through that same list and I want you to think of the second highest group for suicide. You just wrote down your first. So what age range do you think is the second highest? Again, we're looking at less than 15 years of age, 15 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and 85 or older. So you have that written down? Okay. Everybody good? Now I'd like you to think about the farmers that you work with. So get just an average farmer that you work with, male or female? Male. Typical, male. male. White, black, Asian, American Indian? White. 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 Age range? 50, 50. 50s, 60s, 55, 60. So from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, you just answered the three questions for me. So the number one group in terms of suicide
45 to 54. Number two, 85 and older. Blows your way, doesn't it? I had no idea when I started looking at these statistics. The oldest, the older two groups, because I've seen this happen twice, are married couple. One's very ill. Mm -hmm. One can't stand it. Murder, mm -hmm. suicide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or that one person has died and the other one can't go yeah, on. Way. Yep. We do indeed see that. But most often what we're hearing about is what? If I answer that question, I would think around the teen years, yes. right? I think we probably all would have put teens. But thinking this is why I wanted to start with this, to ground us all that this is who we're working with. These are our farmers. And when we look at ethnicity, you might be surprised to see whites. And when we look at gender, it's male. And what do you think is the number one means of suicide? Anybody want to shout out what they thought? Hanging, choking. Well, fire. I'm going to say firearm. Firearms. And you got it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So firearms, by and large, wow. all our farmers own guns. So we are right there with the prime age of 45 to 55 white male owning firearms. So even though the numbers may be a little bit different now, again, this is our warning right here that we are prime for having an elevated rate of suicide within the farming community when times get tough. Okay. So that said, um, I would like you right now to all pull out your phone. And so what is it that we can do? Add in your contacts the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number, if you would please. This number, even though it's national, it will reroute to local resources. So the number is 1-800-273-8255. If you're working with a farmer or anyone and you feel that they are in imminent danger, then calling the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a resource for you. Again, in opening up this conversation, it's, it goes back to asking, how do you ask? And we'll be talking about that and practicing that because that's really a difficult conversation to have. And as Keith had said, you don't want to take the ownership on and asking the person, may, may I sit here with you while you make that call? Or may I make the call and put it on speakerphone? And, and then someone asked the loan officer yesterday, had said, but I get people on the phone that ask me. I said, well, now you can merge calls. Yeah. And you can say that I hear what you're saying. You sound very troubled. May I make this call and I can merge the calls together and I'll be here with you. It's you have, one of these cards and that, that I have it said that everybody got, so it's on there. Oh, awesome. I didn't get one. May I have one? Certainly. Thank you so much, Keith. Perfect. So right there is one wonderful resource. And again, even though it's national, it will get to our local resources. Okay, thank you. So what do they do yeah. when you call that phone number? So that's a really good question. What they're going to do is provide you with the resources that are available. And there'll be a, a talk line as well to help the person. So they can find out what type of danger that they're in, if they're in imminent danger, and then um, of alerting 
either 911 uh, or if there's somebody with them to say that they need to go to the hospital. And if you, that person trusts you to take them and you take them to the emergency room you, and let them know that this person is suicidal. So, good question. Okay, uh, this was something that was just introduced to me yesterday and it looks a little stretched, so I apologize for that. Uh, there was a woman that was a nurse at our presentation yesterday, and I found this to be so incredibly helpful. You were talking about yoga to me earlier. Um, this is actually at a hospice site. It's at hospiceyukon.net, and it's called the Grieving Wheel. And so the very top is the life as usual. We all have our ups and downs. We're going through our daily routine. Everything's, you know, okay. We're kind of at that homeostatic level, right? But then when we have a loss, immediately that shock occurs, the alarm phase. Remember that we talked about the cortisol that's just going back and forth in our brains like this? This is going on right here at shock. We've got resistance, Emily. We've got resistance, disbelief, numbness, disorientation and confusion. If you're working with a farmer and they're losing their farm, think about how their brain is going to be right there. They're in a state of shock. They're, that is loss right there. And as we talked about the agrarian imperative that Dr. Rossman and I actually had a lovely conversation, he was there at Michigan and we sat at the same table. Um, back in the 80s, he actually started the movement of in every single state, there was a hotline just for farmers because the crisis was so dire. And he pushed this movement of mental health within the farming community. So Michael Rossman is his name if you want to look up any information on him. But the agrarian imperative of it's not only something like a farm, if you have uh, livestock, you know, there's that emotional connection to another being. It is a not only the place where they live, it's their livelihood, it's their heritage, and it's also their future heritage for their children and, so, and grandchildren. And so these are the types of loss that are so dramatic. So you may find that the farmer is going to be very resistant, that they're in a state of disbelief. Think about the last time that you lost a loved one in your life, or that if you've had any type of dramatic loss, and these feelings in shock may be very familiar to you. And then we move from the point of shock to the point of acknowledgement, and that's when the chaos begins. And things are even worse than they were in the shock phase. This is when the numbness starts wearing off. <clears throat> And you start having the feelings of fear, anger, guilt. Oh my gosh, I just lost my family's farm. Sadness, and then searching for meaning. And if you can't find meaning, right here, big risk for suicide. Actually, I'll tell you, the woman that introduced this to me yesterday, she was a nursing professor. She had said, you know, I, I teach this. I was all on top of it. And then my husband died. And I was great. She said, I got that funeral together. I got everything done. And I went back to work immediately. She said, two and a half weeks later, I wanted to kill myself. And so she went calling around to try to find somebody to help. And where she found it was at a hospice center. Isn't that interesting? Because I had not even thought about that. She said, my husband was not in hospice but she called hospice care and they have grief counselors there, free of charge. She said a grief counselor per hour costs $185, but the grief counselors there were free of charge and for six weeks, they had her with a counselor and then they had her for another six weeks with a support group. So 18 weeks that she had somebody that was saying, I'm here for you, I understand that this change in your life is really difficult. 
And here, I'll walk with you as we move forward. It's interesting you say in the hospice, because it just dawned on me and made me think about it. When my father passed away, he was in home hospice care. Mm -hmm. But the, when he passed away, the hospice facility down there in Florida said, if you need to talk to anyone, we can make arrangements with hospice up here in Maryland. So it's interesting, awesome. so it reaches out not just within that area. This was in a totally different, you know, different regions and states, but they all work cooperatively. Absolutely, that's fantastic. Thank you for, for saying that. So this right here, this chaos, again, if this searching for meaning comes up empty, this is again a major point of hopefully intervention. With time, new understanding, and then a time for new beginnings. New beginnings. You're never going to go back to the old you. Never. You've grown into something else because of the experience of loss. So this right here, when what um, Emily was talking about, that gentleman that lost his farm, I mean, even recounting it, wasn't he? He was still kind of devastated when he was talking to us about losing the family farm and that trying to make... He thought that going to make the cheese was going to be great for their farm, for their family, making this extra income, only for it to have a major recall, and then losing everything. But then that spurred him into politics, and he was elected. And so there was a brand new beginning, but he said when he was at his darkest point, there was no way that he ever could have thought that there was a new beginning. But just, again, to acknowledge that I understand this, this point right here is so chaotic. But I also think that this gives almost like a grounding for people that you're not going crazy. Like this is part of the grieving process right here. And can you identify a point where you are right here? And that could be a way to open up the conversation. Can you identify where, how you're feeling on this? And then making plans. And the plan may be to find the resources for counseling to move forward or support groups that are necessary. So I wanted to share that because I just learned this yesterday and I thought it was amazing. Um, just last Friday, Emily and I and the other three that trained out in um, Michigan, we attended the Maryland um, Mental Health First Aid and if you're not aware of this organization, they teach, they talk about it like CPR for mental health, that you are the first responders. As a, we keep saying over and over again, you're not the one to diagnose, you're not the one to treat, but you're the one that's there as that bridge, and I love how Emily called it a bridge, to get to the next level of care. And so they have both for adults, and that's what we went through, and for children. And I just happened to be good friends. She used to be one of my adjunct instructors, in fact. Um, she is the director of the Mental Health First Aid. Her name is Jennifer Traeger. And she said, Jeanette, if there are people who want to take this class and they don't have money, please know that we also have scholarships available. So if you or an organization would like to take a class with Maryland First Aid Mental Health, uh, please make sure that you give them a call. And even though I, Emily and I can both attest that that was great, our program for the adult, Jennifer said that the youth mental health first aid is even better. So if you're working with youth, right there is a great program to go through. It's eight hours and then you get a three-year certification. And it teaches you the skills of trying to identify and then bridge that gap with resources for those in need of uh, mental health assistance. And so again, these are things that are off the, the Michigan, but I wanted to make them available to you. The other thing is, so few people know this, but I, I just started this job back in August. August 20th was my first day, but I'm not new to extension. 23 years ago, I actually was the nutrition specialist up in Baltimore County. And so, um, and I was only there for a year and a half when I went back to get a master's. All that to say that back then, 
I felt like extension was the best kept secret there was. I came back in August. I still feel like extension is the best kept secret there is. I think we do such great work, but few people know about us. And so I want to make sure that each time that I'm presenting that I show the information that we have. If you just did a Google search for extension UMD, you would find us. Or if you did extension.umd.edu, then you get directly to our page. And on our home page, you will find, in fact, if I just back up from here, because I clicked on farmer stress. Ah. Okay, well, we'll just keep it at this because here, I'm at, maybe if I go like that, I wanted to take you to our main page. I just did, yeah. There we go. So here you can see this beautiful photo of new farm stress management online resources available. And if the photo happens to change, all the photos are right down here. So you can just scroll over and then you click. And so if you're wondering what resources are out there available, then University of Maryland Extension lists the resources that we have. And so if you go right here, it's a hyperlink for you already. And I also want to point this out because University of Maryland is committed to working with farmers under stress. And they made the um, financial commitment to send the five of us out to Michigan of putting on workshops such as this. They find this to be incredibly important work and um, setting up this whole web page. Right here, you can see there's financial resources, there's stress management, and then legal resources. So all right there at a click. So just remember University of Maryland Extension and you got it. And here, once again, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline that I just asked you to put in your phone is there. And so if you come over here to, I'm going to um, click here for other crisis resources. So here is your national resources. Here's the Farm Crisis Center. Here's resources that are in Maryland. And so again, all right here at our site. And these three, I found them to be amazing. I didn't even realize that we had these, the resources in Maryland. So there's the Maryland Network of Care. And as it says, it offers portals for consumers to search for health and human services by county. Then there's also the pro bono counseling, which is free therapy in Maryland. And then at College Park, I didn't even know this. So those of us that work for College Park, was anybody aware that a couple and family therapy clinic housed in the Department of Family Sciences at, at College Park? that it's a center for healthy families offer services including couple, family, and individual therapy, as well as parent education. So more resources for you when you're working with your farmers. So yay, Marilyn, yay, extension. <laughs> so, all right, let me go back to our PowerPoint then and to Michigan slides. And where's that clicker? Here it is. Okay. And go up to my presentation. All right. So we've already acknowledged that we're working with the population that is at the highest risk of suicide. So suicide warning signs. If someone is talking or writing about suicide, that right there is a very clear indication. Um, it may be someone asked yesterday, well, how do you know that they're not crying wolf? That they actually are sincere about doing it. And I said, well, what's the alternative? If you don't pay attention to that, you know, my, my idea is, you know, when in doubt, help them out. Feeling hopeless, trapped, or like a burden you know, think about on that wheel that we were talking about, the grieving wheel, about the person in that state of chaos, 
of feeling hopeless, angry. How are they getting out? Giving away prized possessions is a big thing. So dad gave me this baseball that Mickey Mantle's signature is on it. Here, I want you to have it. Something that would never, you would ever think about giving away, those are now you're giving to other people. Making a plan and acquiring means is another big thing. So the conversation of having with someone saying, are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you thinking of harming yourself? The next question is, do you have a plan? And do you have the means? Somebody who's thinking about it still should be taken seriously, but if they also reveal that they have a plan and they have the means in which to do it, that's an imminent threat. And as we already established, suicide number one is by firearms. Number two is suffocation. Saying goodbyes. And someone at one of the other workshops had talked about this, that out of the blue, this person that they worked with was like, you know, you have been, Nath, you have been such a great colleague, and I've really appreciated working with you all these years, and I just want to wish you the best in life. Wait a minute, aren't we coming to work tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, so it may seem like, wait a minute, why the sudden goodbye? and isolation from others, but we know that that's part of the far farming culture, right? Is many hours a day that they're isolated. But we also want to look for other cues, like again, are they churchgoers? Are they not attending church? Are there community meetings, ag meetings that they're not attending? Um, all of these withdrawal that they used to be a part of. Loss of interest. And the things that you would normally like to do, they know, you know what, I just don't want to do them anymore. And then mood changes. And this right here is a big red flag. A lot of times we hear about people who are depressed, very sad, feeling hopeless. And you would think, oh, OK, I can deal with that. I can see. That's very clear. That person may be on the path of suicide. And then there's a completely like a 180 change in their mood. They feel light. They feel happy. You're like, wow, you were so down, but now you're just, you seem like effervescent. Why? That right there is where mental health practitioners get very concerned. The person has a plan and they're about to initiate it. And that's why they feel lighter. This is all going to be behind me. I've got a plan to leave this behind. I'm good. And that's the problem with suicide. As I say, it's icky. When I was down at St. Mary's, I had a farmer come up to me after, and he said, Jeanette, I'm just going to tell you, none of this works. And I said, why so? And he said, my brother just killed himself in October. He said, I didn't have a clue. He said, I would go to my brother's house each week on a Wednesday, and I would wash his clothes for him. And I went that week, and there were no clothes in the basket. And so he said, he could have been lying there dead for three days, and I didn't know it. So even though we're talking about signs and symptoms, this is the worst part about suicide, is that sometimes we just don't know. And that's when our own sense of grief and loss and hopelessness can set in. And so as I said to this gentleman, I'm like, well, how are you doing? And you know, again, male, farmer, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I said, well, thank you so much for sharing that with me. I know how difficult that has to be. And that I hope that there's folks that you can talk to, too, because this is, this is heavy. It's a lot. And just so, and he, he kind of looked like he acknowledged that I acknowledged him. Um, but not prying, and, but saying, yeah, this is, this is difficult, and talking to somebody would be good. So suicide warnings. Now, here are things like you may hear it very clearly stated, or it can be coded. 
you know, direct or indirect. So clear would be <laughs> flat out, I'm going to kill myself. But then other times it may be coded. So, so don't be surprised if I die in a tractor rollover. Again, this was really interesting when we were in Michigan and hearing farmers from all over the country and hearing them say, there are farmers that flat out will say, I'm planning to kill myself because I know that my family will get the insurance money, but I'm gonna disguise it as a combine accident and then that will pay off the debt that I owe back to Keith. So they explicitly speak of it. Now as an accident, of course, because insurance isn't gonna pay out if it's straight up suicide. There's the icky part again. Was it an accident? Somebody asked me yesterday as well about the drugs and alcohol. You know, if somebody that we discussed earlier, if somebody is drinking in excess, if they're doing drugs in excess, is it an overdose intentionally to die? And intent is what we look at to code it as a suicide. But is excess hurting behavior, is that considered a suicidal mindset? Icky. So there's a the scientific term, right? Okay. So to a banker, if you foreclose, you'll be seeing my obit next week. Coded, if I should pass away, I want you to have my Winchester 12 gauge. Mickey Mantle baseball, same thing. Coded to a financial officer, what happens to my debt if I die? The loan officer has to pay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, I need 12 more jobs. So... And then a few more, to a doctor. Is this enough medication to kill someone? A dentist, when I can't sleep like this, I don't give a hoot about life. To an adult son, I'm going to be leaving you nothing, I'm afraid, just my burdens. To the daughter, indirect, you'll need to look after your mom when I'm gone. To a best friend or a pastor, you might have no warning signs whatsoever, the icky. And then to the wife, why don't I just shoot myself and let the bank have this place? So this is where, again, we talk about practice. And this is where it gets tough. You have to know that asking someone directly, are you planning, if Nia said, Jeanette, are you planning to kill yourself? You know. Highly unlikely, I'd be like, you know what, I wasn't. But now that you mention it, I think I'll schedule it for next Tuesday. It's never going to happen that way. So don't be afraid to put the question out there. But, you know, trying to feel not intrusive, this is a direct question. And so what I'm going to ask you to do right now is to practice, because it's a hard question to ask someone. I'm asking you not to answer to each other, but just to ask. Ask, do you, are you having thoughts of suicide? So if you could just turn to, 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 you two right there, you two, and just turn and make sure you each get a, a chance of asking. So the thing that's interesting in the three times that we've done, laughter is always part of it, right? Because it's nervousness. It's not a comfortable question. It is not a comfortable question. And what happens if the answer is yes? That's the big thing right there. So if they say yes, the advice is do not leave that person alone. And you're like, wait a minute, what the heck? <laughs> uh, this is my job, not my life. I'm working with this farmer on a loan. So I'm someone, somebody asked that yesterday. Well, when we say don't leave that person alone, that does not mean that you need to grab a sleeping bag and leave it at the office or leave it in your car when you go to the farm and be there 24 seven. 
That means to get that person the resources that they need. It may be that you need to take them off of the farm. I know your sister lives nearby. Can I take you to your sister's house? or your parents, or some place that you're physically withdrawing them from the farm so that that stressor, all they see is a burden and everything that needs to be done and hasn't been done and past failures is not right there staring them in the face. It's like asking that question, are you safe? Excellent, excellent. That's another great way to ask. So if they say, Yes, they are thinking about it. This is, again, where you call for help. Or you can take them directly to the hospital, again, to the emergency room. But the lifeline that I just gave you will provide you with the resources that you need. Or you can call 911. If there is a fear that this person is on the ready, they've got a firearm right next to them, First and foremost, and first responders know this, that go into a scene, your health and safety is tantamount. You have to make sure that you're going home that night. So if you ever feel that your safety is in danger, that's when you need to make sure that you exit the area in order to keep yourself safe and call 911 and make sure that that person gets but the help that they need. But you being in harm's way is not going to help the individual. And Dave Myers, who you all know, both of his sons are police officers. And he said, domestic disputes are the worst, that officers never want to go to those because they know the risk of somebody else getting hurt is great. So if we take someone to the hospital because you know, they say yes, like, I guess I'm having trouble understanding what does that do because just because they're in the hospital, that thought doesn't automatically just like right. vanish out of their head. So what they have to do is a, from the hospital, they're doing a psyche valve on them, and then they'll admit them if okay. during the psyche valve they find that they are in need. So they they do they have a special crisis response just for people that are suicidal. I used to be a professor at Howard Community College, and I was saying yesterday that it's any community college that has a nursing program, it's typically their largest program that's on campus. And it is so demanding and so cutthroat, and these students are always on edge with stress. And it's so fast-paced and so many exams that they have to take. And every semester, there were multiple students that the nurses took, Howard Hospital was right next door, took them in their car literally and brought them over for the eval. You talked about the firearms. I sit there and think about this and go, how many farms, people's houses I go out to, there's a loaded rifle exactly. right at the door. Mm -hmm. I mean, right at the door. I could walk in right now and I could go and I could think of right in my mind how many how many rifles I could go collect right now that I know are loaded. Right. Varmint guns. <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. them. Yeah. They're, they're right there. Excuse yeah. me? Otherwise it's just a club. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, but, just but club that's the club, thing. Yeah. They're in this occupation, if you want to call it. Right. They're, it's very prevalent. Right. It's not like it's, you know, it's very common to see that. Absolutely. So. That's what we were saying. That's why farmers are at such a great risk. When we look at the demographics, the age of farming, the uh, ethnicity, the gender, and the means. Yeah. Interestingly, women attempt suicide more so than men, but men complete suicide more so than women. Because guns are quick. Exactly. Use guns. Exactly. Don't use guns. That is the point. That is the point right there. Thank you, Skip. What about what was um, the point? The point is is that men use guns. Women typically don't use guns, they'll use pills. Overdosing on pills. But guns are quick 
And so that's why men die more so than women. But women attempt more than men. Women will take the pill if they didn't change their mind and call 911. I've seen that. Before. Mm -hmm. Thinking about I'm leaving my children behind. What am I doing? Well, yeah. Getting back to guns, something to think about. The new gun laws that are coming, if you report that somebody yes. is going to commit suicide, yes. they're going to come take all these guns. It could get really, really nasty. Mm -hmm. Something that you really got to think if you want to be caught in the middle of. Mm -hmm. So Dave was talking about that too in my office. That's he said, really, really touchy legal farmers are position. stand up for their constitutional rights to own guns. And if there is a risk that their guns are going to be taken away from them, then it's... The, it, the state police have a, a special trained crews that go into a house in the case of a felon or whoever, or in a case they, that they've report, been reported to a suicide. Uh, the state police go in and take the guns. Uh -huh. uh, and I've seen it happen. And they're not nice, they're not kind, they're, tr they're trained in-house or whatever really and get all the guns and they will go through the house ramsack or whatever because all the guns are gone it's a very difficult situation mm -hmm. you really got to think about it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. yeah and again you really have to think about your safety yeah like you said i mean they're there but then if somebody is in imminent danger, yeah, it, it's sort of like if you took CPR, right? I used to teach CPR. You can walk away and do nothing. You can be trained at CPR. You've got your little card and somebody is having a heart attack in front of you. You can just step right over them and walk on your merry way. There's nothing legal that binds you to doing anything about that person that's had a heart attack even if you're trained. And there's nothing that legally binds you to help somebody here. But if you make that choice, then the resources are here. And again, number one is ensure that your safety is uh, tantamount. But thank you, Skip, I appreciate your your input on that. And so we've already looked at this. Um, this is where I took you for the statistics at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And you've all put the phone number in. And there are other important resources. I'll be handing out a uh, paper to you that has the resources listed. These were provided for us from Michigan. And there's even crisis chat lines. And it may be, again, the first call doesn't need to be to 911. It can be to a crisis chat line. Let's sit down and talk about this. You know, let's try to make a plan of moving you away from this fault. And then veterans, we know that there's a high number of veterans in farming. And so there's a crisis hotline for them as well. And I think I had already mentioned that back in the 80s, there was in every single state a crisis hotline for farmers. But things started improving. So where are you putting your money? And so they're no longer there. Are we going to need that resource again? It's yet to be seen. So the Maryland resources, these are the ones that I just took directly off of our University of Maryland page, and I showed you how to access those. So in review, farmers can have stress due to experiencing extreme economic conditions, nothing new to this group, weather-related emergencies and other reasons, and may not seek help, in part due to the lack of medical resources. And as Andrew? was saying it may not be that there's a lack there, but a lack of knowledge as to how to access those. Uh, listening empathetically instead of sympathetically is the most helpful thing that you can do for someone going through those extreme stress. That positive self-talk, and would you skip share with the group what you shared with me about the post-its? 
Oh, it's one of the things that I've done for a long time and works well uh, because you were talking about these cards. I use yellow postings and uh, I use them for two reasons. If for someone in particular that I'm praying for, I write their name and I stick it in a dash in my truck. Uh, an Amish friend of mine, whenever I talk to him, he says, I said, hey, Jacob, how are you doing? I'm blessed. Uh, sometimes I'll put blessed on it and I just, and, and you change that little card every week. And if you're with a group, you use that. And when the group leaves for the week, they each have their little weekly message on their post and they stick it someplace. For me, it's in the truck because I'm always in the truck. Uh, so you put it wherever uh, it happens to be. I think that's brilliant. And, and the other thing that I use as a constant reminder is, because uh, I read a lot, is on my bookmarkers. I would always have two or three books with bookmarkers on. Usually that's uh, stuff that my grandchildren have done, because it's a positive influence. It's always positive influence. Awesome. Yeah. And, and, that, and that stuff works. That's yeah. great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so that right there, that self-talk and those constant reminders. It's a daily reminder. Um, the one thing that we didn't really point out, and it's sort of like the serenity prayer, of being mindful of the things that we cannot change and also understanding what is the things that we can change and understanding the difference between the two. So when we're in that state of chaos and everything is crumbling and the cortisol is going crazy, and it's very difficult to see, okay, whether I can't change. Um, maybe changing my planting technique is something I can change. And so if I was thinking about your example about a farmer coming in and then kind of divvying it up, well then let's look at the things that we don't have any control over and then let's look at these things that we do have control over. And then out of these things that we have control over, then what changes can we make here? And then bringing it back to this is where we can have an action plan. Um, never leaving that distressed person alone again, calling a friend, a family member. 911 may not be the first response that you need to make. It's getting them back out of isolation, getting them connected with a support system that may include a psychiatrist that needs, because a psychiatrist is an MD. So a psychologist cannot write out a prescription. They can do therapy with a person, but they cannot write, a psychologist cannot write out a prescription for drugs. That has to be a psychiatrist or a, uh, your general practitioner, an MD, um, that can help along that line. But that may be what is needed, is some pharmacological help, pharmacological with drugs, and having that person have some support in terms of therapy. So my question now, after going through this full day, would you be able to deal with a friend, family member, or a participant under extreme help, or excuse, extreme <laughs> stress? Yes. Yeah, you feel you can? Excellent. Or. If you don't feel 100%, do you feel that you could a little bit more than you could this morning? Certainly. Excellent. And my job here is done. <laughs> so thank you all so very much.